All right, so Ms. Aaron Sikorsky, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, last week, the U.S. Army, of course, released its first ever climate action plan, talking about being uh, hopefully net zero by 2050, reducing uh, our carbon footprint by 2030. Um, of course, climate change is a huge, huge issue that we continue and continue to discuss um, more and more uh, nowadays. So can you kind of tell me a little bit about, you know, from what you know, the motivation behind releasing this and really, as you mentioned in your interview with the Washington Post, the level of detail that they really put into this as well. Yeah, no, thanks so much for having me. So the Army climate strategy is a real step forward for the Army in concrete terms of how to tackle climate risks. And when you look at it, the, the overarching goal of the military, right, is to keep America and Americans safe and to protect our national security. And over recent years, we've seen that climate change impacts are affecting the military's ability to do just that whether it is wildfires in California that are forcing uh, military base evacuation or curtailing training days, or uh, intensified hurricanes on the Gulf Coast, which have caused billions of dollars of damage in recent years to Air Force bases in that region. Uh, climate change is, is posing a threat to military readiness and, and installations. And so this plan from the Army is all about how do they manage those risks? Right? What do they need to do to be prepared to operate in the 21st century uh, as climate change intensifies? Because even if we cut all emissions tomorrow, there are still baked in risks right, that we're going to have to deal with in the near term. Uh, but cutting emissions is important too, to avoid catastrophic risks in the second half of the century. And so that's really what this plan gets at. How do they adapt? How do they mitigate or cut emissions? And then how do they train their personnel to be able to manage uh, these, these climate impacts? So let's talk about some of the specifics of that, um, how they plan on doing so. Um, I gave a brief overview of my initial question, but just a little bit more detail in that. And also talk about, you know, uh, some of maybe not necessarily the concerns, but we do talk about here in America, the level of infrastructure that we have for electric vehicles, um, how mm -hmm. a lot of people don't necessarily know that maybe it is already possible for us to make a cross-country road trip with the current electrical network, but there's still holes there as well. So how does the U.S. Army you know, plan on tackling that not only here at home, but perhaps with operations abroad as well? Yeah, so some of the concrete aspects of the plan uh, that I think are worth noting, one is the plan to put a microgrid on every army installation, I believe by 2037, but it relatively, relatively near term. And that helps not only in terms of moving toward clean energy, but also towards base resilience, right? You're not reliant on an outside source of power. You've got something at the base that can help uh, power, power your installation. They also talk about moving to um, uh, non-tactical uh, non vehicles, electric vehicles in the relatively near term across all bases and not just moving to the vehicles, but as you mentioned, building the infrastructure on the bases to charge and manage those vehicles. And that's really important because the Defense Department is the second largest uh, institute in the federal government procuring vehicles after the Postal Service, the US Postal Service. And so if they're moving to electric vehicles, they're building the infrastructure that sends a signal to the market for market demand for these products that then helps drive that, that change outside of the military as well, uh, which is a key focus of the Biden administration going forward. And then you mentioned moving abroad, right? This is something that where the US is in a position to help allies and partners around the globe manage these risks as well, which again, helps US security. Because when we need to turn to our allies and partners for help with other security challenges, if they're overwhelmed by the impacts of climate change, they won't be able to help us. And so this will move us in a direction that uh, by helping them, it helps us in the long run. Let's talk about the importance a bit about, um, obviously the Army is taking climate change very seriously by making this next step they have in the past, but really with this very detailed action plan. And we're talking about the ongoing situation in Ukraine where, of course, Russian forces have had to wait at times to make sure that the ground is frozen. You talk about climate change and we talk about warmer temperatures, but we're also discussing things like, you know, Army members being deployed here at home, as you mentioned, for disaster relief more often as well. So let's kind of talk about the continuance of climate change. You mentioned the baked in, uh, the baked in details there, of course, as well. But let's just talk about the importance of uh, 
of uh, of developing this plan to to begin with you know and to and for both us here at home and for our security risks as well sure sure that's a great great question and i think there's a few things when we talk about climate security right what do, what do we mean and we already talked about the direct risks of climate change to physical infrastructure right that's something um, to be concerned about here at home and abroad but then there's also the risk that climate change exacerbates other threats that the US cares about in, in other countries and regions. So for example, the risk of terrorism in the Middle East or in Sub-Saharan Africa, when you have climate change like uh, droughts or desertification, so agriculture is no longer a viable option for communities, that presents an opportunity for extremist groups to increase recruitment, to perhaps put pressure on governments that can't manage the climate risks that are occurring. And that can lead to conflict. It can lead to strengthening extremist groups in ways that threaten US national security. So understanding those dynamics, building a, a military that can um, uh, prepare for and, and get ahead of some of those dynamics is really important. Um, and, and we see as, as water, river basins dry up in certain places or salt water due to sea level rise uh, makes the soil more salty so you can't grow crops in the same way you used to. Uh, that can cause conflict internally within countries the U.S. cares about as well and, and put, put uh, U.S. interests at risk. And we talk a, a lot about uh, in the research that we've done about how the future of war the reasoning for war quite literally could be, as you just mentioned, um, directly related to climate and, and it's just exacerbating that situation as drier airs get drier, as wetter airs, get, wetter areas get more wet. Mm -hmm. um, so it's something that I found particularly interesting as well. What is your biggest hope for this plan? What makes you most excited about it? And also what might be a concern um, if, if there's anything that you didn't think that was properly addressed in this plan. Sure. I think my biggest hope for the plan, I mean, it's a very, it's a very ambitious and it's moving on a fast timeline, which I think is so important to get ahead of some of these climate changes and that it is so comprehensive. Uh, also that it really makes the case that this is core to the military mission. This isn't extra, right? This isn't instead of something else, but it's actually going to make the military stronger and more capable. I think that's really important, especially to bring folks along who are maybe skeptical that why is climate change a military issue? But you can demonstrate uh, through the reasons we've talked about that that it really does shape the, the landscape. Um, in terms of anything that might be missing, I, I think one of the challenges will be is, is making sure there's follow through on funding support for some of these uh, provisions. There are certain things that the army can do that won't cost any money in this plan. Um, if the, say, local utility grid in the place where the ba uh, base is located has already moved to carbon-free electricity, the military can just plug into that and, and get, that, get that benefit. Um, but there will need to be some funding for some of these provisions as well. And that's where Congress will have to step up and, and provide funding. But I'm confident, given their focus on US national defense, and US security that they'll recognize uh, the importance of, of providing funds to move, move these goals forward. I was gonna say as $500 billion just still sits there unpassed for yeah. climate, <laughs> climate inaction, that, 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 that was the one thing that made me a bit more concerned as, as well to follow through. Um, so this is a great step. What do you think is now next? Because is this specific army specific in terms of you know what might be next for the other branches of the military, um, what do you think needs to happen next, other than just simple follow through by the by the by the by Congress, that kind of thing? Right. So we expect that there will be similar plans put forward by the other services, by the Air Force, by the Navy. Uh, the military will release the National Defense Strategy here soon, within the next month or so, which will provide kind of the overarching strategy for the department. I think it's going to be really important to have coordination between the different branches of the military to make sure that they're taking full advantage of uh, economies of scale, if you will, on some of these, some of these issues. I also think there's a lot of work to be done by the regional combatant commands, so AFRICOM, CENTCOM, others um, to integrate climate change into their strategies and plans. And I know some of them are already doing that, uh, but that's going to be a good next step. And then as, as we talked about the work with uh, allies and partners as well, bringing other countries along, especially in the Indo-Pacific, 
uh, where we see a lot of competition with China? What do our, the US allies and partners need there from uh, the US military and it relates to climate change and climate security? That would be a, an important step. For your um, generic army member here, infantry, what, ha what have you, we have the Letter County Army, army Depot here in Franklin County and our DMA as well. What changes do you think that they're going to notice in the coming years, just just every, every, just on, in everyday life for them? Sure. I mean, some of it is going to be in terms of the, the kind of training they receive, right, to manage these challenges. I think one of the biggest uh, issues for the military is going to be rising temperatures in places where they operate. And I've heard senior defense officials talking about, you know, previously the military's talked about owning the night due to a night vision capabilities and whatnot. Now they need to own the heat. They need to find ways to be able to operate in, in extreme temperatures and not only for the soldiers themselves, but also for their equipment. Uh, a lot of equipment was designed for previous understandings of the climate. And we need to look forward and, and make new, uh, new designs there. I think also, you know, the vehicles they, they use that will be changing. Uh, and, and the kinds of, of conflicts and humanitarian assistance, disaster relief missions are only gonna go up around the globe um, and here at home for the military to support. 